Let's talk about fantasy. Fantasy provides a stage where narrative can occur. It always has a narrative structure that heads from a point of lack or loss to a point of having or accessing the object that's been lost. It occurs in some kind of setting. The fundamental process of fantasy is to lay out the setting upon which the narrative takes place. This idea about fantasy as the setting for our desire is made clear by two really important French psychoanalytic thinkers who devoted a nice little book to fantasy, Jean Laplanche, seen here, and Jean Bertrand Pantalis, seen here. Their little book, entitled Originary Fantasy, Fantasies of Origins, and Origin of Fantasy, Phantasm Originaire, Phantasm des Origines, Origine du Fantasme, appeared in French in the 1970s. Their claim is that the fantasy is not the object of desire, it is the scene. In the fantasy, in effect, the subject does not aim at the object or its sign, it figures itself taken in the sequence of images. So fantasy lays out a scene and then constructs a narrative within that scene. It depicts a scenario which occurs against the background of the fantasy scene or on the stage that allows the subject to relate to the desired object. Without fantasy, I'd have no way to understand how I'm supposed to relate to the desired object, how to take up a position relative to this object. As a narrative, fantasy answers the question that desire poses. So desire is a question, fantasy is a solution or an answer to that question. Desire is a question, specifically what about, about what the other wants. And fantasy tells us what the other wants. It's our idea, our way of imagining what we assume the other wants. This is a point made by Slavoj Žižek, most importantly, in a book called The Sublime Object of Ideology. Žižek says, fantasy functions as a construction as an imaginary scenario filling out the void, the opening of the desire of the other, by giving us a definite answer to the question, what does the other want? And insofar as it answers the question of desire or poses a possible answer, fantasy necessarily functions ideologically. So all fantasy isn't ideological, but the ideological dimension of fantasy is the way in which it tries to answer and tame this problem of the other's desire. If ideology justifies our lack, and I think that's what ideology does, makes us, tries to reconcile us to our lack and give us a reason for it, fantasy offers us the possibility of overcoming our lack and actually acceding to the object, obtaining the object. So you might say that fantasy offers us a path from lack to plenitude, that through the fantasy, we can overcome our status as lacking and feel the joy of plenitude. And we achieve this plenitude when we obtain the object. And that's what the trajectory of fantasy shows. The great example in our contemporary capital society is the lotto. We play the lotto with the idea of gaining millions and having the object of our desire. Interestingly, my grandmother used to play the lotto, and my brother went to buy her a lottery ticket one day, and he said, I hope you win, Grandma. And she said to him, showing that she was a theorist, even though she didn't uh, read many books, she said to him, I can't imagine anything worse. And I thought, that's the only way to play the lottery, knowing that winning would be the worst thing. So we associate enjoyment in the fantasy with obtaining the object, although my grandmother didn't in this case. For her, enjoyment was in the failure to obtain the object, which is the proper way of thinking. We can see a great example of this in the conclusion of Frank Capra's masterpiece, It's a Wonderful Life, where George Bailey, who has 
just spent the entire film losing everything that he values, including the town itself of Bedford Falls. And in the end, he discovers that he really has the love of everyone in the town, which is the object of his desire. And that's why the ending is so satisfying for us as spectators. Mary did it, George. Mary did it. She told some people you were in trouble with it. They scattered all over town collecting money. Didn't ask any questions. Just said, George, in trouble. Tell me. What is this? Uh, like it spread like fish. Another run on the bank? So that look on George Bailey's face, that look of utter delight, is the look of desire being realized. And that's what fantasy makes possible. Fantasy makes it possible for him to go from a position of utter lack, he's totally bereft of any satisfaction, to the most bountiful joy that one can imagine. But the real enjoyment of the fantasy actually can... But the real enjoyment of the fantasy actually consists in the depiction of loss. This is counterintuitive, but I think it's crucial that it's the point of loss in the fantasy that we really enjoy. And I think what's interesting is Hollywood films spend most of the time depicting the hero in a position of loss and very little time at the end depicting the plenitude of attaining the object. So they understand that we actually enjoy the obstacle to plenitude within the fantasy rather than actually attaining plenitude. That it's obstacle, not object, that we enjoy in the fantasy. Again, It's a Wonderful Life, during the middle of the film, nicely makes this clear. So George Bailey, in this scene, experiences the loss of the object. He loses the Bill Bailey building and loan, his whole life's work. And what's nice about this scene is that it really shows the enjoyment that takes place through loss because the building and loan has been play, replaced with this scene of rampant enjoyment everywhere in the new town of Pottersville, which replaces Bedford Falls because George Bailey wasn't there to save Bedford Falls from the evil Potter, and so Potter turned it into the town of Pottersville. So what's nice, again, is that this scene shows how we actually enjoy the obstacle. We enjoy this scene even more than the recovery, or you could put it this way, this scene makes possible the recovery of the object. The recovery of the object is unthinkable and unenjoyable without this scene of its loss. Fantasy depicts the enjoyment of loss counterbalanced by the pleasure of obtaining. So what fantasy nicely shows is that there's this dual process at work, enjoyment of loss, pleasure of obtaining, unconscious enjoyment, conscious pleasure. So we can be conscious of our pleasure, whereas the enjoyment of loss is always unconscious. <laughs> 
except in fantasy, which allows us to experience the enjoyment of loss directly. This is why the radicality of fantasy stems from the necessity of loss within its logic. So every fantasy has to show loss or else it doesn't function as a fantasy. This is a point made really nicely by Elizabeth Cowie in her book, Representing the Woman, Cinema and Psychoanalysis. Cowie says, fantasy in imagining enjoyment without loss always posits a loss already enacted to which it answers. I think the great example of this is the beginning of the original Star Wars film, A New Hope. Because here, when we see the huge Imperial cruiser coming over our heads, chasing the small rebel ship, we see that the Empire already has the upper hand over the rebellion. So the rebellion already has sustained loss relative to the Empire. And this is a point of our enjoyment in the film. It cannot avoid the depiction or the presumption of loss. The film ends with a medal ceremony. But what's interesting is the awesomeness of the Imperial cruiser in that opening scene and the loss that it portends far dwarfs in enjoyment benefit this concluding medal sequence. Like the medal ceremony, no one remembers. The opening scene, everyone remembers. Our ability to enjoy the fantasy is thus tied to the loss of the object, not to the recovery of it. Even if there's an extreme pleasure, as in It's a Wonderful Life or Star Wars when Luke destroys the Death Star in the recovery of the object, still the enjoyment is tied to its loss and the obstacle to regaining the object. Thus, the best depictions of fantasy focus on the enjoyment of loss rather than the pleasure of the recovery, or they manage to show the pleasure of recovery tainted by the enjoyment of loss. That is, they show how loss pervades the recovery. I think the best example of this probably ever is the ending of the original Blade Runner film, where Deckard, as he's ready to leave his apartment with Rachel, discovers a small origami unicorn left by the policeman, which shows that his fantasy has been actually understood and perhaps produced by some outside agency. So Deckard has to confront that he might himself be a replicant, and thus he might be have only a short lifespan himself, and Rachel has only a short lifespan. So this encounter with direct encounter with loss at the moment that they're getting away is one of the great moments in cinematic history, I think, about we get this supposedly successful phantasmatic ending, and then it's at the same time we get it, we get the origami unicorn, which introduces loss into the heart of it. So that's the very end of the film. And here's the voice of the policeman. And he knows that maybe he knows he's a replicant, but he certainly knows he's experiencing the imminent loss of Rachel because she's going to die. He knows she has a three-year lifespan as a replicant. So the unicorn is the reminder of that and his own, his own imminent demise as well. But what's interesting, and I think Blade Runner nicely shows this, is we don't simply want the pleasure without the traumatic enjoyment, that without the trauma of the enjoyment, the pleasure wouldn't actually be pleasurable. If we just cut straight to the medal ceremony in Star Wars and didn't go through everything else and just had a two hour medal ceremony, there would be no pleasure in that. So the trauma of the enjoyment actually makes the pleasure pleasurable. 
we also need a radical divide between the fantasy and our reality. And if we realize a fantasy and reality, we lose touch with the loss that underlies every fantasy. So realizing the fantasy actually has the effect of destroying what's enjoyable about the fantasy. This is a point made by Freud when he's discussing his analysis of Dora. This was one of his five great case histories. And in that case history, he says, if what subjects long for the most intensely in their fantasies is presented to them in reality, they flee from it. It's a nice example of this in, an, in a very good golfing joke. So a golfer says to his priest, I'm really worried about heaven. I, I just, I love golf. And what if I get to heaven and there's no golf there? So the priest goes, okay, don't worry about it. I'll pray to God tonight and I'll come back to you tomorrow with an answer. I'll, I'll let you know. And so the next day the priest goes to the golfer. He's like, I've got good news and bad news. And the golfer's like, okay, good news first. Priest goes, there's a great golf course in heaven. Don't worry about it. And the golfer's like, excellent. What can be the bad news? Priest says, you've got a tea time tomorrow morning. So the idea of having the fantasy realized, the fantasy that there's a golf course in heaven, is the same time, it's the punchline of the joke because it introduces the loss of the fantasy, of the enjoyableness of the fantasy. He can no longer enjoy it once he's going to have it realized. And I think we can assume that golf would not be as fun in heaven as it is on earth. We even go so far, I think, as to repeat self-destructive acts in order to avoid any realization of our fantasy. That we're constantly doing whatever we can to keep fantasy within the realm of fantasy and not having it become real. The ideological valence of fantasy, however, depends on how we relate to it. It's not fixed once and for all. So Fantasy is not necessarily conservative. It's not necessarily radical. It depends on the attitude we take up toward it. Most of the time, I think, we fail to invest ourselves fully in the fantasy. And it's interesting to me that this is what allows it to function as an ideological supplement. So not being fully in the fantasy, keeping some distance from it, causes the fantasy to be ideological. We pay attention solely to the recovery of the object and repress its loss when we're having this distance from the fantasy. There's a great example of this in the Hollywood classic by D.W. Griffith, Way Down East, which focuses, the most famous scene of the film, focuses solely on the recovery of the object and it represses the loss of it earlier in the film. The hero saves the girl from the ice flow, from falling over the waterfall, and it's pure plenitude. And the film ends with the couple happily reunited. And the loss before the, the hero's loss of the woman earlier is obviated by this ending. So he not only rescues her, but he eliminates, represses the prior loss. Now, one different way of relating to the fantasy is what Jacques Lacan calls in his Seminar 11, The Four Fundamental Concepts of Psychoanalysis, traversing the fantasy. And I think the best description of what traversing the fantasy means comes from this guy, Rick Boothby, in his book, Freud as Philosopher. Boothby says this, to traverse the fantasy is to be more profoundly claimed by the fantasy than ever, in the sense of being brought into an ever more intimate relation with that real core of the fantasy that transcends imaging. So fantasy is primarily images, but there's always what Boothby calls a real core of the fantasy that cannot be reduced to the image. And that is the point of loss and the point at which we enjoy, the point from which our enjoyment derives.
this real core of the fantasy, is the loss that underlies the imagistic scenario and cannot be reduced to the image. When we see the object obtained in the fantasy, the key is to do what the end of Blade Runner does, that is, to recognize the enjoyment of the loss of the object even at the moment that we're seeing it being obtained or that we're obtaining it. That's the key to a politically more radical attitude toward fantasy.